what do people trust? When it comes to history, studies over the past two decades come back with a clear answer. Museums are the most trusted source. Museums are perceived as unbiased and neutral, and yet they are heavily curated by people. And like all people, curators are not unbiased. For many topics in our history, neutrality is neither appropriate nor even possible. And so each time there's a new study or a new survey where 90% of respondents suggest that museums are neutral, that they just present artifacts and facts and don't also offer context and interpretation on their own, a couple hundred thousand museum professionals get a little salty. For them, suggesting that museums are neutral is tantamount to suggesting that all they do is place items in a room. And for that reason, the phrase museums are not neutral has become a rallying cry among museum workers. Do you know there are over 30,000 museums in the United States? The majority of these are dedicated to history. Science and art constitute most of the rest. There are so many museums, there's even a museum of bad art. And so that got me thinking. If there's a museum of bad art, is there also a museum of bad science? A museum of bad history? If there is, I think the last couple of years have enough material to fill both of those. <laughs> but there's not a museum for bad history and there's not a museum for bad science. Honest attempts at art that go wrong are still art. And that's the central message of the Museum of Bad Art. And we like art and we like museums because we like the way they make us feel. And you can appreciate a painting more if you know its context, but you can still find beauty and meaning in works of art even if you don't know the background and even if you don't understand the piece from multiple perspectives. That's not true for history. Today we are talking about the power of stories. Mr. Rogers told a story, a beloved story, about a quote he carried with him in his wallet. It said something to the effect of, there's no one you couldn't love if you just knew their story. Think about that for a moment. There's no one you couldn't love if you just knew their story. It sounds wonderful, but no one? No one? What if we change the word love to understand? You can understand everyone if you know their story. That's the power of history. And as a historian, I may be a little biased here, but I think taking the time to understand someone's story is an act of love. And speaking of love and speaking of history, when people learn that I'm a historian, they often say things like, oh, I, I love the Civil War. I hear that a lot, but if I'm honest, it does seem a little peculiar. I think what they mean is that they enjoy or they find meaning in their ongoing quest to understand the Civil War. And that's one of the central points I hope to make today. History is a process. Now, history shares that with science. We learn the scientific method in school, and we learn the process of making art by trying our hand at different formats. And every parent has their own museum of what others might see as bad art because they don't have the same context or shared experience. But in the small amount of time dedicated to teaching history in our schools, very little of it, unfortunately, is dedicated to the process or getting students to think about the process of how history is made. And I think that's why history is often perceived as a collection of facts. Deep down, we all know that history is something more more than a collection of facts, but the misperception remains. So much so that if you go to the website for the American Historical Association, it exclaims in bold print, history is not a collection of facts about the past. Their publication and that of the Organization of American Historians are called Perspectives and Process. Perspectives and Process. So, what is the process for making history? Number one, start with a question. And now you've got to resist the temptation to answer it right away or make quick judgments. You've got to get out of your default mode. Get out of your own head. See what others have found. Study their evidence. And then search for more evidence and more perspectives. Revise and repeat. Historical interpretations change over time because of that process. And then the last thing you need to do is organize what you find in a way that offers meaning. And the best historians are usually good storytellers. And if you're lucky, 
someone with a bigger audience and perhaps a better story than you will take your work, but they'll cite you, and congratulations, you're now a footnote in history. <laughs> Presenting history as a completed story can be more entertaining than teaching the process. And popular history podcasts have names like Slow Burn or Hardcore History. If there was a really honest history podcast title, it'd probably be called, well, it's actually quite complicated. The process of history is what matters because it forces us to move beyond our default mode of quick judgment. I value that quote from Mr. Rogers because it teaches us something important, starting with the goal of love. When it comes to history, you need to start only with a question and a genuine curiosity. You need to get out of your default mode of trying to answer that question as quickly as possible. Move past what millions of years in life have taught us to do. Make quick judgments and act quickly. If the fire is too hot and makes you uncomfortable, turn away. Understanding history pushes us beyond that default mode of turning away from what makes us uncomfortable. That's where learning happens, and hard history is important history. So in art class, you end up with a finished product, and in science class, you get to make volcanoes. What if you got to make history in your history classes? Nine years ago, I started what I thought was a one-semester project. I asked students to go forth and tell a story, a story of a place that mattered to them. And I built this app, and it shared your location, and then it connected you to that history. And it was clunky. But the students loved it, and I called it Clio in honor of the ancient muse of history and hoping it might also inspire. The students dug into the challenge, and we started putting their histories on a map, and then, like all digital things, it, it started to break. And I told the class, this has been a wonderful experiment. The students felt differently, and they told me stories of seeing and going to historical sites with it, with family and friends. And I was moved, so I created a nonprofit so that Clio would always be free for everyone because no one gets to own history. And I worked with developers who actually knew what they were doing. And nine years later, I've helped hundreds of organizations and thousands of people share the history of their community. And I want to share with you what I've learned along that journey. History is not an answer. It's a process. And as I work with people who are serious and sincere about learning and sharing history, I see a tremendous difference between their first draft, usually based on what they already knew, what they assumed to be true, what they wanted to be true, maybe one or two sources, and what happens in that final draft when they are informed by the process. And in that process, hundreds of students have told me that they couldn't possibly finish their project because the third person they talked with told them something slightly different from the other two. To which I say, you, you interviewed three people? So I pull up their first draft when they were confident that they knew everything. And then I ask them to compare that to their final draft. And in that moment, they understand. The full truth is unknowable. And historians make choices, and we don't always get everything right. But we follow the process. And by citing our sources, we are making a contribution, perhaps a starting place for others. History, like science, follows a method. The works in the Museum of Bad Art, those are works of art, not because they are faithful reproductions or even really well made. They're works of art because they're honest attempts. And it's still art if you don't like it. That's true for history, and that's true for science. Unlike the artist, historians and scientists can revise their work. And they can and they must borrow and build from the work of others because history is collaborative. Some of my students continue to work on their Clio entries even after the class ends. And some have even turned what started as a digital marker into a physical one. My students make history. And along the journey, they've taught me that sustainable learning requires joy. We can all force ourselves through an all-nighter. But the day in and day out, that kind of journey, sustainable learning, requires joy. It also requires accountability. And perhaps that's been one of the great lessons of this pandemic. Sustainable learning requires joy and accountability. History is not an answer. History is a process. 
It's the difference between our default mode and our first draft, what you assumed to be true, what you wanted to be true, based only on your own experiences and perspectives. It's the difference between that and your final draft, and the story you can tell because of your journey towards understanding. Thank you.